The real goal should be reduced government spending rather than balanced budgets achieved by ever-rising tax rates to cover ever-rising spending. Thomas Sowell, American economist, social philosopher, and political commentator. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Liberty Dad podcast, a discussion on politics and culture. If you're tuning in live, well, you're not tuning in live because the live stream earlier got cut short. There was a problem with StreamYard, so pre-recorded it is. Nevertheless, I want to thank you for giving me your time. Do me a favor, folks. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to like and subscribe to my channel and for the really serious folks out there. Hit the bell so that you never miss an episode. All right, let's get into this. All right, Doge, it's official. The Department of Government uh, Efficiency. Almost said education. (laughs) No, no. Doge is now official. Donald Trump has come out and said, we are creating it. And I believe him. I mean, he put a public presser out there. He's got Vivek and he's got Elon on board. I can't imagine that you're going to put out something like that with these two men and not follow through. That just seems unlikely. So what did he say? Here is his statement. Uh, I'll read it for you just in case you are not looking at the screen. I'm pleased to announce that the great Elon Musk, working in conjunction with American patriot Vivek Ramaswamy, will lead the Department of Edgy, uh, keep doing it, lead the Department of Government Efficiency, Doge, Together, these two wonderful Americans will pave the way for my administration to dismantle government bureaucracy slash excess regulations, cut wasteful expenditures, and restructure federal agencies essential to the Save America movement. This will send shockwaves through the system and anyone involved in government waste, which is a lot of people, stated Mr. Musk. It will become potentially the Manhattan Project of our time. So it sounds like he wants to nuke government. I mean, I can't complain about that. Anyway, going on, uh, moving on, Republican politicians have dreamed about the objectives of Doge for a very long time. To drive this kind of drastic change, the Department of Government Efficiency will provide advice and guidance from outside of government and will partner with the White House and Office of Management and Budget budget to drive large-scale structural reform and create an entrepreneurial approach to government never seen before. I look forward to Elon and Vivek making changes to the federal bureaucracy with an eye on efficiency and, at the same time, making life better for all Americans. Me too. I look forward to that. Like, if that's his plan, even though I didn't vote for him, I look forward to it. Importantly, we will drive out the massive waste and fraud which exist throughout our annual $6.5 trillion of government spending. They will work together to liberate our economy and make the U.S. government accountable to, quote, we the people, all caps. Their work will conclude no later than July 4th, 2026. A smaller government with more efficiency and less bureaucracy will be the perfect gift to America on the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. I am confident they will succeed. Okay, this sounds great, right? Like, it sounds really, really good. I'm definitely excited. Now, here's the thing. It's official, but it is not yet implemented. So keep that in mind. I I see people getting out online and they're like, get excited. They're like, it's happening. And yes, there should be some excitement. But we should also remember that nothing is certain until it happens. Now, not everybody was excited necessarily, and not everybody will be. Elon Musk said he would like to fire about 80% of the federal government while working with Donald Trump. So then in response to that tweet, I said, if Elon Musk were to influence this to happen, it would be his greatest achievement in life. And I think it would be. I think it would actually be, this is going to sound weird to say, but I think it would actually be greater than if he were 
uh, to be successful in making us a multi-planetary species. Now, that seems kind of big, but on the other hand, it kind of seems inevitable in a way. I mean, we've already been to the moon, right? So we've already been to another planet. It's just that we're not a multi-planetary species just yet. Like, we're not living on these other planets. We're not transporting goods back and forth, those kind of things. Uh, And that will be amazing, but I think that's in some ways inevitable, whereas I look at government growth as inevitable. So curtailing government, reducing government spending, I think is more monumental because it's the exact opposite direction of what would be expected. Right. It like it's it we expect government just to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. We also expect technology to deliver more interesting things, including multi-planetary travel and living. So those two things are inevitable at some point. When? I don't know. But what is not inevitable is government is cutting government spending. So I think that would be his greatest achievement. I think it's justified to say that. Uh, so this was interesting. This is, and this is just a random comment that I saw online. Uh, this fellow says, now that Doge is official, expect the following. Countless government bureaucrats will scream bloody murder that the cuts Elon and Vivek will do are going to be awful for America. Federal employees will scream bloody murder that cutting their jobs will result in terrible failure of government and programs will fail left and right. By the way, remember, That was the exact same scenario when Elon bought Twitter and was like, I'm going to cut 75% or however. Yeah, it was like 75% of his workforce. And he cut them. And I remember people were like, today's the last day on Twitter. Tomorrow it's going to fail. And then tomorrow came and Twitter was still there. We were all talking and, you know, doing our posting and whatever. Right. So Twitter remained like Twitter never actually went down like for any significant amount of time as a result of his cuts. Now, there might have been some hits and misses here where there was, you know, like an outage for an hour or something like that, or maybe even less. And it's hard to say whether that was a direct result of the cuts or not. But it wasn't long. It was only like half an hour, maybe an hour. I I don't even know know if any of them ever hit an hour. So, and, and this happens all the time, like, like, there are websites dedicated to is Twitter down, is Facebook down? <laughs> like, cause these things actually do happen. So you'd have to really dig in and have some information available to you to determine whether or not they were a result of the cuts. But what we do know is that Twitter continued on. Um, so then he goes on to say, legacy media will try its hardest to convince the American people that Elon and Vivek are single-handedly destroying America with their careless cuts. I, I agree. It's probably going to happen. And then suddenly, like magic, the U.S. government will reach unprecedented levels of efficiency and responsiveness to the American public. I think it's possible. And I think it's possible even if they only get like halfway, a quarter of the way. I mean, if they make any substantial cut, I think we're going to see some really unprecedented things from government in terms of like efficiency and what we can do and improvement to American life. I think we'll see that. But not everybody was convinced. So here's this guy, Harry Sisson. Now, if you don't know Harry Sisson, he is this like young 22-ish year old guy. Um, him and another guy, um, is, it some, is it Mark Lowry? No, um, I can't remember his name, but it's another young guy about the same age. And they're like a little duo. And they're always on Twitter like praising everything that Democrats do, like everything. I don't think I've ever seen them say anything negative about their team, never grumbled, nothing. Whatever change is made, it's the most exciting change ever. That's just how they are. They're basically cheerleaders uh, for their team, like literally cheerleaders, like that's all they do. And he says, the Department of Government Efficiency sounds like pure satire. Okay, I'll give him that. It does kind of sound like satire, but it isn't. It's real, and the convicted felon who's going to be the next president just made it up. As I've said, we're screwed. Like, he's just, this is how he is. 
He's excited about everything that Democrats, like the Democrats, like a Democrat could take a very long bathroom break. Follow my drift here? And he would just be like, man, that was the greatest one ever. It was awesome. And then a Republican could do the same thing. And he'd be like, why are they in there so long? What are they doing? You know, like, like that's just how he is. So he's not convinced uh, that the Department of Government Efficiency has any value whatsoever. But like, whatever. He's like 22. I'm sure that I believed plenty of things when I was 22 that really didn't make any sense. All right. So when people um, are upset and griping, it's probably a good idea to demand that they answer for some of that wasteful spending that's out there. So to help with that, I found some interesting things, uh, some interesting tweets. So this first set of tweets come um, just, I don't even know who it is. His name is Dylan Loomis. I'm not sure who he is. But then the second one uh, comes from this randoland.us where I think that's all they do is um, they post government waste. So let's take a look at some of the government waste that we have out there. This is from Dylan Loomis. All right, here are some of the most insane statistics about the waste and inefficiency of the U.S. government and why Elon and Vivek's new doge is such an incredible and crucial development for America. Number one, the CBO revealed at least 1,264 federal programs and bureaus have expired authorizations, but they still received $516 billion in funding for fiscal year 2024. Hmm. He goes on and says, number two, the Government Accountability Office, CBO, estimates the federal government waste $247 billion in taxpayer money each year. This is, this is the Government Accountability of the GAO. I said, uh, I said something else. But the GAO, they estimate $247 billion in waste. Billion with a B, a capital B. Number three, the Department of the Treasury reported 24.5 billion in quote unreconciled transactions end quote in the past meaning it spent about 25 billion dollars on unknown items like we just don't even know what we're spending do you remember um california they um reported recently come out earlier this year that said they spent 24 billion dollars and have no record of it they spent it on trying to deal with the homeless problem out there in California. And not only did they not deal with the homeless problem, but it actually, I think it would, I think it doubled or it increased by like 50%, but it increased one way or another. I can't remember how much, I think it was an increase of 50%. Homelessness increased 50% and they had dedicated $24 billion to, to reducing it. And they don't even know where the money went because they just stopped recording it. Like this is our government for you. Uh, last item, I think is the last. No, it's not the last item. Department of Agriculture employees misused government issued credit cards, spending millions on personal purchases like concert tickets, tattoos, lingerie, and car payments. Huh. So, people that work for us, effectively, if you're working for the federal government, you work for the people, they were buying concert tickets? Like, I haven't been to a concert in, gosh, 10 years? I'm old and I'm busy. I can't get to these things. But I haven't been to a concert in years. And like some of these guys on are taking my money to, to pay for it. And they're getting tattoos. Like I have no problem if you get a tattoo, pay for it yourself. You want lingerie? You want a new car? That's great. Pay for it yourself with your money that you've earned for producing something. Whatever that thing is that you're supposed to produce. All right. Um, he goes on and he says $33.2 million was spent on transgender monkey research. Now, it might sound a little weird. Like, why would they... Because a lot of these things they do on animals before they do on people. So in that regard, fine. And I'm not, I don't really take an issue with researching on monkeys, uh, even for weird stuff like transgender research. But with your own money, not with taxpayer money. The NIH spent part of a $2.7 million grant to study Russian cats walking on a treadmill. I, I, I can't even make heads or tails of that one. I, I don't even, I don't even, like, who? Like, 
like somebody's got some nerve to submit a request to the government and say, we would like to study Russian cats on treadmills and see what we can, we, we can come up with. And they literally asked for like almost $3 million. That's crazy. The DOD ruined $170 million of military equipment by leaving it outside. $170 million. That's crazy. Now, I don't know what they mean by ruined. Does that mean it wasn't operable? You know, it, it, it didn't meet army standards anymore. And so then we gave it to some other country and then conveniently had to go buy more. I don't know. Possibly. The U.S. Agency for International Development spent $6 million to promote tourism in Egypt. Hey, Egypt, get your own money to promote tourism. I'm all about touring, you know, going on, a, you know, spending time as a tourist in another country. But my government shouldn't be spending money to promote it. Let's see. Uh, then we've got the SBA, Small Business Association, gave over $200 million to music artists like Post Malone, Chris Brown, and Lil Wayne through the COVID Paycheck Protection Program. Call me crazy, but these guys are fantastically wealthy because they've been fantastically successful. They don't need money from the government. Now, I know my fellow libertarians will say, hey, nobody needs money from the government. That's fine. I get that. But if we're talking about like people that are in need and could use a leg up, it's certainly not successful music artist. Figure it out. You've got all those millions of dollars. You've got money, probably, that came from me so that some employee in the Department of Agriculture could go ahead and buy the ticket. Like, maybe, I don't know, maybe they bought a ticket to one of these guys, and then these guys got a COVID paycheck protection payment. Like, okay. The U.S. military bought soap dispensers for aircraft at over 80 times the commercial price. Do you know the joke about an $800 hammer has been like, I think I've heard about that since I was 17 years old. I'm 46 now. Since I was 17, I've heard the running joke about the government overspending. And one time I was actually, somebody gave me a, a hint at to, as to why. So this is supposedly what happens. I don't know for sure, but this is what I was told years ago. Why an eight, a, a hammer might cost $800. They said, what happens is, the government will, they'll put together the specs that they need and they'll send it out and whoever's developing it will develop it. They'll send them some prototypes. The government will test them, decide that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't meet their needs or whatever. So then they'll redesign it and then send it out for redesign and keep doing that repeatedly, which apparently drives up the cost. And so then they end up spending a lot of money because they kept getting prototype after prototype after prototype that wasn't what they wanted. And so I don't know if that's true, but one way or another, you should never spend over 80 times the commercial price. I mean, it's crazy. We've got, I got Walmart right down the street so I can go to Publix. And if I decide, Hey, you know what, whatever I, this soap in here is too expensive. I might actually be able to go down to Walmart and get it cheaper. Like, so if I can find a way to get something cheaper, it's not unreasonable to ask my government, Hey, if you have to have soap dispensers on your aircraft, which is, I, I get it. You guys you know, you may be trying to keep some cleanliness and some hygiene, at least be efficient about it and don't spend over 80 times the commercial price. The importance of the Department of Government Efficiency cannot be overstated. It really can't. Uh, this fellow is right. All right, so we've got some more here. So this is interesting. This comes um, from the instant, this from, from randoland.us. And I'm going I'm to go through about 10 of these here. Because I really want to drive the point home. Just how bad we need a Department of Government Efficiency. Institute of Museum and Library Services Grant 2024. $665,000 purpose. Create an exhibit about Paul, Pauli Murray, a civil rights and LGBTQ plus activist. Okay. All right. Let's see. Oh, let's go. Uh, where we are? There we are. There we are. All right. Uh, National Institutes of Health Grant. $698,000. Recipient, University of Pennsylvania. This one doesn't even have a purpose. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure there is, but it just didn't have one. Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration Grant, $700,000. Uh, National Endowment for the Humanities Grant, $150,000. We'll just go through these quickly. National Institutes of Health Grant, 
$173,000 purpose, developing and testing a stigma reduction focused gender affirmative mobile health program to engage Chinese transgender women in HIV prevention via promoting their mental and sexual health, HIV self-testing, and use of HIV in gender-related community and medical resources. $173,000 to develop a mobile health program that will get Chinese transgender women focused on HIV prevention and to promote their mental and sexual health. Like, this is so niche that it's crazy. Like it, it, And it's for another country. Why are we subsidizing another country? All right. Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration Grant, $700,000. Recipient, the Hopi Tribe. Enhance the mental health and well-being of youth and young adults up to age 25 with an emphasis in LGBTQ. Like, I don't even know what this means. Enhance the mental health. Go outside like everybody else. All right, that's pretty mean, but I mean, again, we're spending tons and tons of money and are we getting any feedback as to whether these programs are actually delivering? Like, let's just set aside for a moment that they shouldn't be getting this money, but let's ask the question, like, is it even producing the results that we're expecting or are we just spending money? Next one up, USAID grant, $300,000. Um, purpose, HIV prevention, care and treatment services to key populations, men having sex with men, gay men, people, gay men. That's what it means. Like if you're a man having sex with another man, you are gay or maybe bisexual. We can allow that one. Like, I don't know why they're having trouble just saying gay men. Anyway, transgender people, sex workers and their clients and sexual networks. Okay. Guess what? HIV has been around since the eighties at this point. There is no reason for anybody to not already be seeking out and managing their own prevention and able to find their own care. Like we've already passed all that. We don't need $300,000 to the Association of Medical Doctors of Asia, Nepal, right? Because this is going to Nepal. But again, it's been around since the 80s. So whatever we've learned, that information We can just package it up and send it on over to Nepal and say, here you go. Here's what we've learned. We don't need to give them money so that they can try to figure this out on their own. All right, let's go on. Let's see. we got a couple more here. National Institutes of Health Grant, $341,000. Decision making in, I'm going to see if I can say this word, metoidioplasty and phalloplasty gender affirming surgery. MAP gas. You know what? No. We don't even need to know what this is about. No. That, no. All right. Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality Grant. 391000 Recipient. Arizona State University. Purpose. Development and evaluation of an online contraception decision aid for transgender and gender nonconforming persons assigned female at birth. So we're going to spend almost $400,000 so that we can develop a website that helps guide people, transgender and gender non-conforming people, in deciding what kind of contraception they should use. Again, figure it out. And how many, do we not have enough organizations out there that can already disseminate this information and kind of got it worked out? How is it that you have all these resources dedicated to information and we still have to give a university $400,000 so that they can make a website that says, here's how to decide what contraception you might need. Oh gosh. And these are like, look, I didn't grab these, um, specifically. I just like went down the line when I went to, uh, this Twitter account, I just literally went down the line, just grabbed the first ones that I saw. I, so I, this is just what was posted. Um, national institutes of health grant, 766,000 to Temple University purpose developing and pilot testing an e-health decision support tool for young trans women to improve informed decision making about prep. Okay. That last one, like that last one, look at that last one. It was development evaluation of an online contraception decision. Like are this are these organi- what are these organizations out there doing that they're not producing this kind of information, centralizing it, 
so that we have to give out grant after grant after grant that are effectively within the same area of responsibility. Like these are basically the same. Like we're just spent, it's like somebody comes up with this like slight offshoot of an idea and they're like, you know what? I'm going to need $400,000 for that. And then they request it from the government and then the government gives it to them. And then people wonder why the government has a spending problem or why people are excited about Department of Government Efficiency because of spending like that. Now, wait, maybe, maybe you're just thinking those are more in the recent years and maybe those were specifically picked out to pick on the trans folk, right? Because a lot of them dealt with like LGBTQ and trans. So let's go back. Let's go way back, like, I don't know, eight years. So I have an interesting video here. And this comes from John Stossel. It's about eight years old or so, maybe a little bit older than that. Um, so I want you to listen, just watch this video. And we're going to unmemory hole spending by going back a little bit, just in case you were concerned about the particular spending that I showed you, which you should be concerned, but not over the fact that I pointed it out. So here we go. Is it playing? There we go. I titled the show The Money Hole because covering government, it does sometimes seem like they pour money down a big hole. Their spending makes this spoof from the onion believable. Is it time to close the national money hole? Uh, that kind of talk is, is alarmist and irresponsible. America needs the money hole. Right. Was Driving it. truckloads of money out into the New Mexico desert and dumping it into a massive pit is one of America's greatest traditions. It's frankly, it's a national yes, treasure. Look. Okay, I want to be clear, that was a joke. There is no actual national money hole. I don't think. But watching politicians work, there might as well be. Pork is the word we use to describe dubious government projects that benefit some, but are paid for by all of us. It said the phrase was coined 100 years ago by someone <laughs> who said congressmen grabbing your tax money look like hungry people grabbing pork out of a barrel. Pork today looks like this. You paid to blow up beaver dams in Mississippi and to eliminate brown tree snakes in Guam. Today, government spends your money to study the immune systems of shrimp running on treadmills. What is it? You know, it's one of pot. It says five hundred thousand dollars to study shrimp on a treadmill. And if you're if you're listening to the audio, I I promise you the video is you're missing out a lot because it's literally showing a video of a shrimp running on a treadmill, and they spent five hundred thousand dollars studying this. Like, who comes up with this stuff? And why is it that, because a moment ago, we were talking about what was the, um, uh, what was the uh, Russian cats on a treadmill? What is it with studying animals on a treadmill? <laughs> anyway. And you pay to create this robot that folds laundry. These programs create jobs. Senator Harry Reid wants to fund frills in his state. A cowboy poetry festival. A cowboy poetry festival. Some of these spending projects are... Okay. How, like, look, if you're a cowboy and you want to write poems and then you want to create a festival centered around that, poems that are from cowboys about cowboy things, I'm all for it. We shouldn't pay for it, though. And if you're familiar with slam poetry, that started in coffee shops where people would just go to a coffee shop and they would set up a little and other people would come in and they would do their slam poetry. And now it's to the point where, you know, they have like national contest slam poetry contest. That's not my thing, but I think it's kind of a cool thing. I, I think it's neat that we can indulge in all these different things in society. We just shouldn't have to all pay for it because if it's popular enough, then it will pay for itself. <laughs> but cowboy, Poetry festival, like these are like again, and and I'm not mocking the idea of cowboys getting into poetry, right? Like that's not what I'm doing. I'm laughing at the idea that we're spending so much money on these things that are extremely, extremely narrow and niche. Like we're not talking about something like everybody's going to enjoy. We're talking about something like a very small crowd is going to enjoy, but we keep spending money, and it's just like every little person, when I, not, every little group 
is getting their own cut of the pie rather than figuring out how do we make this happen on our own dime or better yet, making money. Let's continue. So silly, they sound fake. Are you An anti-waste group sent this woman out to ask, is this government program real or fake? $2.6 million was spent to train American prostitutes to drink responsibly. Most people thought that was fake. I think that's fake. I say false. You would say false. The actual truth is worse. $2.6 million was spent to train Chinese prostitutes in China to drink responsibly. <laughs> So again, we keep spending money outside of our country. So these, uh, and I'm pointing all of these out on purpose because I want as many examples as possible out there in the ether so that when, you know, when you're talking to somebody, when one of your friends is like, oh, they're trashing this whole idea of Doge, you can go, what about spending $2.6 million to help train Chinese prostitutes to drink responsibly? Here, okay, let me do this. Chinese prostitutes. Let me, let me, uh, let, let's, let's put this on. Uh, can we do this? Yeah, let's do this right here. We'll get it really up close. All right, up close. All right, here's, here's my freebie to Chinese prostitutes. Two drinks a day, max. That's how you drink responsibly. Two drinks a day. And for the week, how about you limit it to no more than two times a week? Now, that's not official medical advice. That's just, hey, as a dad, telling you how to be responsible when you drink. Whatever you're doing, you're going to be more responsible if you limit two drinks at any one time twice a week. There you go, Chinese prostitutes. And there you go, America. I have saved you $2.6 million. You're welcome. All right, let's get back to that video. All right, I'm going to probably have to start over. Let's see here. Let's get, let's scroll back and forward a little bit here. All right, so I lost my place. That's okay. We're going to find it here uh, real quick. All right, so Chinese prostitutes, there we are. Sent this woman out to ask, is this government program real or fake? $2.6 million was spent to train American prostitutes to drink responsibly. Most people thought that was fake. I think that's fake. I say false. You would say false. The actual truth is worse. $2.6 million was spent to train Chinese prostitutes in China to drink responsibly. At a time of financial limits, why would the American government pay for that? $1 million in stimulus funds to help smokers stop smoking by giving them BlackBerry smartphones. Somehow that one is real too. So, do you know this is old? Like, this is not recent. Because they're talking about blackberries. In fact, if you're under 30, I'm not even sure if you know what a blackberry is, like as a phone, or if you've ever seen one. But it was a phone that was popular in like 2000, somewhere around that time frame, right? And <laughs> they're going to give them... The I just can't. I just can't. Blackberries were supposed to help smokers connect with other people trying to quit. I used to smoke, yeah. But then you got a blackberry. But then you I got a blackberry. <laughs> and the woman's like giving him a hard time. She's like, oh, so you got a blackberry phone. This this is like the first attempt at social media, or one of the first attempts, right? Like, hey, are you a smoker? Why don't you get this blackberry phone? You can connect with other smokers. It'll be like your AA meeting for smoking. Um uh, so this is just, it's insane. After they spend your money, the government charges you again for signs that brag about how they spent your money. Some dubious spending got funded through earmarks. That spending slipped through by individual members of Congress who are eager to use your money to win votes back home. President Obama signed bills that included 19,000 earmarks. And you hit now! And then the Tea Party movement happened. They have to ban earmarks. That's Any right. Republican right. who does not vote to ban earmarks will have a primary challenge. Earmarks became... I'm pretty sure that didn't happen. Sorry, but Tea Party, I think you failed on that. Or they maybe started, but they didn't follow through with it. Because, it, this, again, this is like some eight years ago or maybe even a little bit older. And so had that been happening continuously we would actually have some more efficiency here because we would have less spending. 
because Congress members would be starting to get wise and say, I should not vote for something that has earmarks, right? So this is a, that's a failure on the American people. You should have held the, their feet to the fire and you should have kept them feet on the fire until they, until they did what we wanted them to do, which is stop spending money. Let's continue. Enough of an issue that when Republicans took back the House, they vowed not to earmark. We're listening and serious uh, about ending business as usual. And then the president said Chair, this. If a bill comes to my desk with earmarks inside, I will veto it. And so Congress banned earmarks for two years. Some people we talk to outside my office like that. Oh, I'm happy about it. And I hope they never come back. I think that's a good thing. It's good if they follow through. But will they follow through? I doubt it. Earmarks will come back. Congressional director spending will come back. John Cornyn's quoted in the paper saying they're coming back. He's head of the Republican Senatorial Campaign Committee. They're coming back. Senator Reid wouldn't talk to us. Neither would any of these other big spenders. Maybe hmm. it now means they're embarrassed by their spending. But I doubt it. Because stupid spending still happens every day. I live in one of the richest neighborhoods in the world. Sting. Jerry Seinfeld, Alex Rodriguez, Alec Baldwin, and lots of rich people live around here. The last thing we should get is free stuff from taxpayers. But look at this. A few blocks from my apartment, they're giving away bike helmets. Absolutely free. Are you handsome or what? Local politicians got a federal grant to help them do this. Is this a big success? It's a tremendous success. Of course, it's dumb to do this, especially in a rich neighborhood, but if you offer to give people free stuff, they'll take it. It's true. Who doesn't take free stuff? And then the worst part about that is getting it back. And I don't mean like, hey, we should go and get the helmets back. What I'm saying is when you start spending money to give to people, it's very, very difficult to give it back because those people are voters. So I am all in support of Doge. We're going to end the video here um, just, you know, for now. Um, you know, basically, I wanted to give you just an idea of some of the things that you can keep on the top of your head as far as what is going on with spending and with the government. Because it's a big deal. And there is no shortage of unnecessary spending. Like normally I would say like everything has scarcity, but it feels like with government and spending, scarcity is a word that like doesn't really exist. Like there's no, there doesn't appear to be any scarcity. We get these huge mammoth bills and, you know, then you get smaller bills that, you know, want to spend money. I think one of the, um, it didn't pass, but one of the bills that I did a review on, they were talking about um, reparations. And I criticized the bill because, they, number one, they weren't giving any reparations to people. Now, not that I think that we should, but that's not what it did. What it did was it would spend $12 million to research information regarding slavery. And I was like, well, wait a minute. Don't we have, like, historians and other organizations that are really putting a lot of effort into you know, diving in and learning some of the history, maybe history that, you know, a lot of us didn't know about and they're producing videos and they're producing different content to promote, like, hey, here's what we learned by, you know, reading, you know, people's diaries and other things like that, right? We have organizations that are already learning and then we're going to spend $12 million so the government can research. And what was really interesting about that particular bill is that a lot of the things in there were things that we already knew. They're like, that, you know, in, in like they weren't questionable. Like slavery started at this time and ended at this time. Okay, that's that's pretty clear cut, you know. And so it was like it was a total waste of a bill and a total waste of $12 million, which I believe it never passed. Uh, so good thing there. But it was, th that's the problem. Just politicians sit around and they think stuff up. Hey, what can I, what can I do so that I can get reelected again? When in reality, our Congress members should generally be pretty bored. They, sh they should actually have so little work to do that they don't need a salary or a very little one. And if they want to fund, you know, a more lavish lifestyle, then they absolutely have no choice but to go to work just like everyone else. That's what should be happening, and it's totally not what's happening. Now, 
Now that we've clearly and unambiguously identified a need, there is a need for Doge. There is a need to reduce spending. Very clear. Evidence is right there. Can't argue it. So let's talk a little bit about practicality. From Trump's own press release, Doge will exist outside of the government. I think this is a good thing for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's the power of the bully pulpit. So this organization now, you know, they may not, it may not have any teeth, but they're going to have the power of the pulpit to go out and tell people and say, here's what we've uncovered. Here's where this spending is. Here's, you know, and they have an interest and a self-interest in making sure that the Americans know about it and that we're angry about it. So I think that's a good thing. It's, it's a little harder to get the power of the bully pulpit if you're in government. Why? Because you have all these rules and regulations and things that you have to follow, whereas if you're outside of the government and you're just simply getting access to the information, then you can do with it as you will. Number two, it concludes July 4th, 2026. That's a good, sunsetting it for after two years, I think is phenomenal because it gives them two years to deliver results. So we're not, we're not going to be waiting and saying, well, hopefully they can come back with a report, you know, by the end of Trump's administration or uh, um, presidency, you know, like, no, July 4th, 2026, we have it in writing. It should conclude and we should have, it should have delivered um, on its promise, on, on, on its mission by that time. Um, I, I love specific time frame for, div, for delivering results. Uh, but there are some other issues. So I've got a couple of videos here. Let me play this video and we'll talk about, uh, i got two more videos, we'll talk about it here. Abby, let's talk about this Department of Government efficiency that Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy will be charged to lead. The fact that it's called that, D-O-G-E, Doge, like Dogecoin, Elon Musk's, you know, beloved cryptocurrency. Uh, is that not sort of the ultimate middle finger to Washington, to their critics? Like they're starting this gig trolling. I, I absolutely think so. But it's also putting the Trump administration on a collision course with the House of Representatives, which has the power of the purse. They can't unilaterally laterally cut trillions of dollars from the federal government. And so you've got a lot of vulnerable Republicans who are not going to be happy about these spending cuts that are so potentially severe. OK, so, yes, that's true. Um, a collision course with the House. It's actually not a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. So while Doge won't have any power in itself, again, going back to the bully pulpit, it can broadcast to those who do, voters. And those people can call their representatives about wasteful spending and, you know, some of the things that we saw a few moments ago. So what we can do with this organization, and hopefully this happens, is that it will become a place that people regularly check and then podcast and uh, various, uh, you know, various social media, it will get more attention because now that's their goal. Their goal is to uh, uh, end some of this spending. And part of the way that they're going to have to do that is by publicizing it and ensuring that people know and then people like me and other people who have bigger platforms can run with it and let all the viewers know, all their audiences know. And so we can spread this information as far and wide as possible and say, hey, before they spend, what was it, $2.6 million to train Chinese prostitutes uh, how to drink responsibly, before they spend that money, maybe what we can do is get that information public and then people can start calling up their representatives and saying, you darn well better not vote on this bill. Uh, just like the Tea Party said. So I think, I think this, is a, a, this is a good opportunity. Um, as she said, many Republicans won't be happy. But here's the thing. Politicians count two things phenomenally well. Number one, votes. Number two, money. So it's not really going to matter how happy the Republicans are or aren't over some of these things maybe getting canned. Because as long as their constituents know and are leading the charge, then the constituents can call up and say, hey, Mr. Republican, uh, I demand that you vote no on this bill because this bill 
has a lot of unnecessary spending, and this is unacceptable to me. And if that person wants to stay in office, then if they get enough people to call them up and say, I don't like this bill, here are some of the, you know, the reasons why I don't like this bill, then that alleviates their concern. Because at the end of the day, a politician's concern is getting reelected, like with very, very few exceptions. All right, so here's another clip that we're going to play. It's, it's from the same woman on MSNBC, but she's got some different people talking this time. And so let's check out this clip here and see what we get. So let's see, three. All right, video clip three. Maybe. Mm, let's see what we got here. Is it maybe four? Let's see. Let's try this one. So if you look nope. up the word, uh, if you look nope. up the term red my, state my, fat. My bad. I think it was this one. I had it right the first time around. All right. You know what time it is. Let's Sorry, talk folks. money, power, politics. And of course, let's talk about Elon Musk's Department of Government Efficiency, <laughs> an acronym that just so happens to spell Doge, a cryptocurrency linked to Musk, Dogecoin. It sure seems like that $130 million he spent to help Trump get reelected was worth every damn penny. Absolutely. Think about it this way. $130 million is well spent if cutting regulations and wasteful spending contributes to future revenue. Future revenue can happen in many ways. Number one, if, if some of this wasteful spending impacts his businesses directly, then that's a plus. But more importantly, if this wasteful spending ends up with more money in Americans' pockets in the long run, then that means they can go buy more things. They might be willing to buy that Tesla when they have more money. So this is all this is is this could absolutely be well worth one hundred thirty million dollars because Elon is probably looking at the future. He's probably not looking and saying, What am I gonna get right in the moment? What am it's more like what am I gonna get later? All right, let's continue. Here to talk about it, Ron Insana, CNBC senior analyst and the CEO of iFi AI and Cardiff Garcia, editorial director for the Economic Innovation Group and a former economics journalist at the Financial Times and NPR. Okay, so first of all, it's the Department of Government Efficiency and they've got two guys running it, yes. Vivek and Elon. That doesn't sound so efficient. Okay, so it may not sound efficient because it's like, well, you only got two people and they're going to analyze these things. However, they could hire staff. Like, it's, it's unclear exactly how this will be funded. Um, again, maybe it's self-funded. Maybe they fund it for two years. And with the hope or the intent that after two years, uh, the spending in America changes with the government, which results in more uh, increased money in the pockets of Americans. And so in the long run, Americans may have more money to spend on things that these guys are invested in. So if you're, if you're looking at a long-term game, the long game, it could absolutely be very efficient. The other thing, I want to show you this image here real quick because I thought this was very interesting. Uh, so this is, uh, this is what Elon Musk tweeted out in May. No, I'm sorry, March of 2024, so earlier this year. He said, in the coming weeks, Grok will summarize these mammoth laws before they are passed by Congress so you know what their real purpose is. How, so he's already built something that could easily uh, a, a allow for uh, 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 um, digging through some of these bills and identifying some of this government waste. Because he's already, he, back in March, he was already saying, like, look, these huge omnibus bills, my AI is going to read it and summarize it for you. So imagine that you submit a bill to Grok and you say, uh, give me bullet points of every single expenditure in this bill. And then it just highlights the, ex it just comes down. And so it's a thousand page bill, 2000 page bill. And it comes back to you and says, here's all the bullet points of every expenditure that's listed in this particular bill. And then it gives you like a page number so you can go and reference it. Like that's great. So I think his AI, I think Grok will probably play a significant role in Doge. And no, they probably won't need more than two people. Or if they do, it's it's going to be very, very few. So I, I think she's incorrect on that. I think it could absolutely be efficient. It just depends on how they, how they conduct it. Let's continue listening. 
We don't even know if it's a, it's not, not going to be an office of the government either. From what we've read thus far this evening, it's not going to be inside the government. And so that eliminates any concerns about them having to divest their personal holdings and any of the businesses they run. Dogecoin, by the way, just as an aside, is up 20 percent tonight on this news. Shocking that it okay, makes but, absolutely but no sense at all. Just because they're going to say it's not going to be an official part of the government. Mm -hmm. Both of these men have conflicts of interest or have investigations or have, have, have massive contracts with the U.S. government, and they will be in a position to cut programs, cut jobs, cut budgets, and, and at the very least, see where all the money is getting spent. So even if they're not officially inside the government, it feels like a conflict, no? Oh, absolutely, 100%. But the question... Okay, I kind of disagree here. I mean, kind of, but kind of not. Number one, is there a conflict of interest? Yeah, probably, because they do have contracts and, you know, whatnot. However, everybody has a contract. I have a contract, a conflict of interest. I have a conflict of interest if I were to be tapped and said, DL, we want you to come and sit on our Doge board, and you're going to help review some of this stuff. Why? Because I'm a taxpayer. And there are certain things that even if I don't want to benefit from them, I do. Right now, we, I know we complain about the roads, but there are things like roads and other services that, I am allowed to utilize as a citizen, right, or as a person in America, uh, I have access to. And so me cutting spending, I might selectively choose to cut the spending of the things that I use the least, right? And then if you, the audience member, were tapped, you might have a different set of interests that you're looking at. So everybody has some level of conflict of interest. I don't think that, I, I personally, I look and I say, I don't think... That should be the determiner of whether or not somebody is permitted to have access to this information and be part of this new organization, the Department of Government Efficiency. Because everybody does at the end of the day. We all do on some level. So somebody's got to do it. And we pay taxes in one way or another. You know, one way or another, we benefit from government spending. Roads, school loans, regulations, you know, regulations that benefit us but don't benefit our competition, those kind of things. Everybody has some level of benefit because the government has grown that ridiculously large. And so if, if the issue is, well, we can't have people that have a conflict of interest, well, that would mean nobody. All right, let's continue. And two is, I mean, they're talking, at least Elon Musk in recent weeks was talking about cutting $2 trillion from the federal budget. Now, of that, $900 billion or so is non-defense discretionary spending. Okay, so let's pause it for a second. All right, maybe $2 trillion is a pipe dream. Maybe it's wishful thinking. If we only get a quarter of that, $500 billion, that's great as a nice start, and it creates a precedent because it allows us to cut, and people can see one of several things. Either it wasn't so bad after all, or it was a little rough, but we quickly overcame it. And I believe that one of those two scenarios will play out. You, you, cut, you, you cut all this stuff, it's going to be like ripping off a Band-Aid. And in some ways, when you rip off that Band-Aid, it's going to sting and hurt, but eventually your wound's going to heal. Um, or it might sting and hurt and continue bleeding. You patch it back up a little bit and then eventually heals, right? So I, it, when I say patch it back up, don't let's not dive too deep into that analogy. I'm just kind of trying to make the point that, yes, it could be initially rough, but eventually it's going to get better. And that's just the way it is. When you have government this large doing this many things, there is no other way than to rip off a Band-Aid. And, and no matter how you do it, like even if you do it slowly, it's going to hurt. Now, the question is, how long will it hurt for and how quickly will we overcome it? And I think there's an opportunity where we could quickly overcome it. Um, let's continue on. Everything that the government can spend money, money on discretion in a discretionary fashion, but excludes interest on the debt, defense, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, all the things that are mandatory spending items that account for roughly 86% of the Interest budget. on our debt. More okay, so let's talk about this mandatory spending. The name of the department is Department of Government Efficiency, not Department of Government No Spending. So it's hard to imagine of all the mandatory spending is necessary and adds value to Americans or that spending cannot be made more efficient. So the goal is to make it efficient. 
Let me give you a contrived example. I often add things to my Amazon cart and then I move them. Sometimes I'll go back and I'll look through my, my cart and sometimes I'll move things to save for later. So then what happens is later I come back to review and I see if I want them. And sometimes I do sometime and then I buy the item. Sometimes I decide I don't want it. It was just a fleeting moment. So I remove it. And other times I decide that maybe I still do, but I'm not ready. So I leave it in the save for later um, box, right? And so that is how I make my spending more efficient. Now, we don't have a cart and a save for later for the government. It's a contrived example. But hopefully you understand what I'm getting at here, which is we can do things differently and spend less money. We can be more efficient about the money that we spend, stop spending it on, on what was that, shrimp running on treadmills. And if we have to spend it on something like Medicaid or Medicare, then when we take the, the spending over here that is frivolous, when we take the spending that was wasteful, even in areas that maybe were important, and we get rid of that, then we can focus on the spending properly of things that maybe are mandatory and maybe we're not quite ready to just cut off yet. It's like this, again, it's about efficiency, not not spending. And it's reasonable to believe that how we spend money as a country itself is inefficient and that we can have some things while doing less spending. It's a reasonable thing. It's not unreasonable to believe that. Um, and, and I think the examples that I showed clearly demonstrate this. All right, let's, let's listen. One of the more. biggest expenses dollars. we have yeah. in this country, and it's only going to, it's only going to grow. Yeah. So you can default if you want, but that's a whole other set of problems if that's the way you want to get out of paying that particular. It isn't part of the key issue here, though. Okay. So they want to talk about interest. All right, so cuts don't necessarily translate into lower taxes, at least not immediately, and not necessarily ever, but hopefully. The more you cut in one area, the more you have to move to another. You can reallocate the money that you're already receiving, like interest. So if there are important things that we cannot just simply default on, or maybe the changes that we're making are rather dramatic, so we don't want to default and make things even that much more dramatic, the money that we're saving by being more efficient, by not spending it on garbage, can go toward those things. Then we're, again, being efficient. It's the Department of Government Efficiency. And I think it's interesting that even MSNBC, that's where this comes from, is acknowledging that it's not a bad idea. So here, let's 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 watch this last few seconds. So that we don't actually know if they're going to be in a position to do anything, right? In a position to cut anything. We don't know what kind of teeth this thing's going to actually have, right? We know that the White House has listened to these guys so far. Excuse me, Donald Trump has listened to these guys so far. But the Department of Government Efficiency isn't like an actual thing. It right? could be infrastructure week number 11. It could be. <laughs> okay, so what she's talking about there for, in, for infrastructure week number 11, if you're not familiar with it, um, uh, I'm going to read to you from CNN just an article that kind of summarizes it. This was written back in 2019. No fewer than seven times, including this very week, has Trump's White House declared that its chosen theme of a week would be infrastructure, only to see those plans thwarted often by the president himself. Um, so basically what happened, the president would be like, all right, we're going to have infrastructure week. We're going to focus on that. And then other things would get in the way and then they wouldn't have infrastructure week. And it happened repeatedly, like some 10 times or something like that. That's what she's that's what she means. When she said, hey, this is infrastructure week number 11, it could, be that it could be that he's talking about a whole bunch of things and then unfortunately gets so tied down with other things that he's unable to implement it. But again, as I said earlier, I think with the names that he's chosen to bring on board, I think you're more likely to see this happen because he's got Vivek and he's got Elon Musk who are huge names and they have a huge vested interest in making sure that this comes to fruition. So I'm not so sure that this is necessarily going to be week 11, especially if the American public really demands it. If we start hammering and making sure that, yes, we want those, we want a more efficient government, then all those members of Congress that might find things to get in the way or obstruct, they could be held accountable for this. So I, and, and so it's in their interest 
to get on board and make sure that it happens. But again, this is only the case if the American public keeps up the loudness. So again, what we need to do is be loud about it, but we also need to know, like we need to let them know we're not letting up and anybody who gets in the way of making this happen, including the president himself, will be punished for it. All right. I think we're about wrapped up with this could video. Could be nothing. By the way, the, the could be a the concept nicest, of a plan. Yeah, yeah, the nicest, most charitable spin on something like this is that if it is paid attention to and if it is taken seriously, right, I'm not saying it will be, but if it is, it's not a terrible idea to have no. something like this and that looks for inefficiencies in the government, right? There are tons of people right? in That's this country idea. that desperately want us to cut government spending, that want somebody on the outside to look at it because they right. feel like the government is so inefficient and fat. That's a fair gripe. I mean, that's, this is fabulous. MSNBC is actually like, yeah, this is actually a good idea. This should happen. I agree. It should happen. But folks, it's only going to happen if you don't get too excited yet. Be excited. But remember, nothing is certain until it happens. So you can't just run around and declare it a win until it happens. And the way to make sure that it happens is not to be complacent and parade around like it's a win. You need to make sure that your representatives know this better happen. And it better happen in the way that the American public is expecting it to happen. And that expectation is that it A, gets created, and then B, they're not stymied in any way. They have all the access to the information they need. And then when they produce a report that says, here are things that need to be cut, that we cut, is absolutely much of it is possible. Hopefully all of it. Because I would imagine, without even seeing anything, that whatever report they produce that says this is what you should cut, I would probably agree with all of it. And so they should cut all of it. All right, folks. Thank you for watching. Apologize for the miss up this morning out of my control, but we managed to come through. I hope you found this episode informative and inspiring. Be sure to catch me Monday through Friday, 7.30 a.m. for an informed discussion on politics and culture. Make sure you're subscribed to my YouTube channel, or if you prefer my Rumble channel, you can go to youtube.libertydad.com or you can go to rumble.libertydad.com. While you're there, let me know how I'm doing by leaving me a comment. Last but not least, I want you to remember if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people, and your product is liberty. I want you to have a great week. Catch you next time. But for now, I'm out.